What I thought to talk to you today about was just the journey that I've gone through basically in my life from preschool, primary school, my secondary school, which is very turbulent, my various jobs in my 20s, and then my light bulb moment, um, where I am today, and also some advice that I can give you all. Um, yesterday I decided to go into my attic, which is busy getting even more loft insulation in it, to get some photographs. So whilst I'm talking about my life, I thought you could actually see what I look like. So there I am. I was born Tanya Barbara Hume on the 28th of July 1968. Um, my name Tanya came from the Alsatian next door. <laughs> One of the questions I, I wished I'd never ever asked my mother, but I'm sharing with you today. Um, very happy life. My zero to five years was very happy. You can see me laughing there with my little sister. Little sister had dislocated hips, so she had to wear calipers for a long time. She's very well now. Her daughter had the same and his now very well as well. But a really, really happy childhood, very loving family. My mum didn't work and was always there for me, so I can't complain at all. Oh gosh, you'd be our primary school. <laughs> my mum got fed up with my long tuggy hair and got it all cut off. My son looks identical to me there. My husband's been showing everybody yesterday. Um, primary school was difficult. I think primary one to four, I've been thinking about this because my little boy's in primary three. It was all fine. It was all absolutely fine. I think from P4 they realised that I couldn't write and I couldn't read. So I got taken out of class for a lot of the work and got put into remedial classes. I got a wee bit upset when I talk about it because it was very upsetting. I got made to feel like I wasn't good enough at school, that I wasn't worth being in with everybody else. So myself and two or three other people were taken out of the class during most of the lessons and I was put into another room. Most of the time just played with things rather than actually got a one-to-one -to, -one to help me. And I did find that difficult, but the photos I've chosen today are the things I did out of school. Look at all my brownie badges. Look at all my certificates. I wasn't stupid, but the school didn't pick up on that whatsoever. But that gave me the strength, that gave me the ability to, to keep going and to feel that I had something. And all the people that knew me out with school didn't even know that I wasn't good at school and that I had to, to get taken out of class all the time. Interestingly, can you see I've got birds, I've got atlases on my wall. I was very um, interested in life. I wanted to know a lot and it was very pictorial. I didn't read an awful lot of fiction. It was all non-fiction. Um, um, fiction. And, I did struggle. I really didn't understand quite what was going on. What I do always remember was I was good at maths. In the beginning of every class, the teacher would have everybody adding up sums and had to put their hand up. And I must admit, I wasn't far off the top. But they never, ever picked up on that. They never thought, actually, Tanya is quite bright here. She shouldn't be taken out of class all the time. It just continued all the way to P7. Secondary school. See the difference? I found hair dye in a perm. <laughs> <laughs> And the rest of my teeth grew in as well. Um, yeah, I just love finding those two last night. Um, secondary school, very difficult, very turbulent. I ended up leaving the, second, the first secondary school I went to, which is where all my primary friends went. I was given a lot of freedom in first and second year. However, that's not what I needed. I needed guidance, I needed help. And a lot of classes, because I couldn't keep up, I just didn't do the work and nobody checked on me. So when it came to the end of second year, they said, you're not able to go forward for any exams whatsoever. They wanted to move me to a different school, one for people who were, you know, basically not ever going to sit exams, a bit like, you know, sort of a college tile. And I just thought, no, and I said to my mum and dad, and they had been getting me extra tuition at home because they had started to see that I had problems um, and I was struggling. Um, and they said no. And, I give them credit, they sent me to private school, but for three days it was obvious that it was too late in life and it was too difficult for me, and they also didn't understand what was the problem with me. So I got sent to another secondary school, so that was in third year. And they did seem to understand a bit more about me, and they seemed to give me the guidance and also my mum and dad up to the private tuition that I got at home, and I used to get three to four hours a day. And I actually left that school at the end of sixth year. It took me a while, but I got six old grades and one higher. And I thought that was a massive achievement for someone who was told that they weren't able to, you know, to be in normal mainstream schooling. But even then, I didn't know or understand what dyslexia was. Back in these days, I put the dates up because I thought it was important for you all to see when that actually happened. Um, and it was only when I started working. One of my first jobs when I left school was working for the AA. And I made so many spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes that they actually wanted to sack me. 
And I pleaded with them, and it turned out that I was the seventh best-selling salesperson they had in their team, and there was about 3,000 of us in the UK, because they did their insurance side, um, that I pleaded with them, no, and, and eventually they actually wanted me, and they did go to my, general, my GP, my doctor, and, and ask him to do an assessment. Now, at that time, I didn't feel it was an illness that required a GP. However, I had a lovely GP, and he suggested that I went to local college and got assessed. So that's what I did. And when I got assessed, I actually found out that I had a reading age of nine. Now, that was me at the age of 19, and I was told I had a reading age of nine. I had still managed to get six old grades and one higher, which I thought, and the higher, by the way, was maths. <laughs> I did get my English old grade, but it took three sittings. Um, and the others were things like modern studies, um, computing, because I had just started. So there were ones that didn't quite require the language so much, and there were ones that I really had enjoyed listening and learning via other channels. So I, I found that whole experience, like Sandra said at the opening speech, very, uh, um, I don't know, uplifting for me, suddenly realising what was actually the problem and, and where, what to do about it. And they did assess me and give me lots of tools. So I brought one of them here today. They gave me a, a yellow sleeve. That's with the colour they worked out. As soon as I put that over paper, you know, any typed pen, what a difference, huge difference. I was like, I wish I'd had this years ago just would have been so different, my whole life would have been so different. So I, I was my own enemy at 19. I took that on board, however, and I'd like this next slide, I've said my various jobs, I worked for my sports. I, I didn't think I had an academic head in me. So all I did was do various jobs so that I was able to do my sports. And I love snow skiing and water skiing. That was my own speedboat, actually. I actually passed my powerboat license at the age of 16 long before I even got my driving licence. So I knew that I wasn't stupid, but I had been made to feel that way from school. I just felt anything out with school I was able to achieve, but within school they just did nothing for me. So the sort of jobs that I did do was working for the AA, I was a dental nurse, I worked in bars and clubs, I worked in retail, and I went on to be a sales rep. And that took me right the way through to 1999, which was um, just coming up um, for my 30th birthday. And unfortunately, Everything changed for me. I contracted Lyme disease. It's a debilitating neurological disorder. I was bitten in the arm by a tick. Um, I ended up in hospital for quite some time, and then I had a couple of years where I just literally slept and hardly ever left the house. Did have a wheelchair, but I just didn't use it. And I thought I'd share with you my blue badge. And this is the only photograph I have of my palsy. And I don't know if you can see one side, it's not symmetrical to the other. The whole of my left side, I completely lost all the feeling in it. Um, and I lost most of my memory and I lost my ability to speak as well. It took me about six, seven years to get back to normal life again. And it was very tough, I can't deny that. However, what it did make me do, I couldn't do my sports anymore. I couldn't do or lead the life that I was able to have achieved before that. I kept my boat in the driveway for two years, as my mum called it, an expensive ornament, because I kept thinking I will get back to it all. And it became apparent that I wasn't going to get back to it, and I still haven't to this day got the ability to do so. But what it did do is made me start to use my brain. I had to think, I had to think well, what else am I going to do with my life if I'm going to be in this sort of state? So I went back to Perth College and I started doing evening classes, just two hours a week. Sometimes those two hours were the only time I ever left the house. And I did healthy eating, Tai Chi, genealogy, all sorts of courses. And then I decided that I was well enough to start earning some money because I was on disability living allowance. I was still living on my own. I didn't have a partner at the time. And I wanted to have some form of independence that I wasn't on benefit. So I started doing people's ironing. A girlfriend found an ironing board with a seat on it and I was able to do ironing. And then from that, I thought, what else can I do in my pyjamas? <laughs> Photo restoration. So I went back to the college and learned all how to, to restore photographs. And from that, I started my own business, restoring photographs, because I thought people have had them in the attic for years. They're not going to be any rush to have them. So here's me showing a bit of my entrepreneurial flair, and I'm trying to think, right, I'm stuck in a house. Never been like that in my life. Always someone who lived 100 miles an hour. What am I going to do? And then it was just at that point, it was in April of 2006, I'd married my husband in 2004, and we were trying for a family. And it was at that point that I got my light bulb moment. I got a big gas bill in. And my husband, every day I used to give myself a challenge, and he said, what are you going to do today? And I said, I'm going to sort this bill out. No idea where it was going to take me. 
But basically, I looked at my utilities and I thought, how can you read them? How can you understand what's going on? My bill was nearly £500 at that point. I wanted to know how much it was per hour. And if I turn my radiator down from three to two and a half, what actual difference did it make to this bill? I didn't have a thermostat. I had big high ceilings like this. They don't tell you. So I looked online and the only thing that they sold is smart meters. So I thought, well, I want a smart meter. I looked at smart meters. They're only smart for whoever owns them. They're not smart for us at all. They just make no sense whatsoever. So I started thinking to myself, we need to have some form of live energy in our home and in businesses. So sitting at the kitchen table, now I am no artist either, I can tell you. I used to hide these, but now I'm obviously showing them to everybody. My husband's an estimator for a flooring company, so um, this is his graph paper that sits on the kitchen table every day. So I used his graph paper, and this was his G-Sock shop watch that he was wearing at the time. I just needed some inspiration to start doodling what I thought live energy should look like. And I had a st my stepdaughter was eight at the time, and I used to spend a lot of time with the old people in my street. Because whilst I was in rehabilitation, they were always much worse off than me and made me feel like I had something to give. So I'm thinking of them while I'm developing it. So I had to think to myself, if I'm going to take this forward, was I investable? Well, I was registered, still registered disabled at that time. I had just become pregnant um, with my son through IVF. I hadn't worked for seven years. I just got my first computer. My next door neighbour actually bought it for me. I was so chuffed. I wasn't IT literate at all. I'd never invented anything before. I'd no experience at all in the energy sector. I can hold my own now, I tell you. Um, and I'd never attended university or college. I had done my evening classes, but to me it wasn't the same. Dyslexic. And I was told by ICAS, which is the Innovating Counselling Advisory Service, um, that I needed to move very fast. So at that point in my life, I had to start to make some of my own, you know, put my money where my mouth is. Um, and I don't know, I, I sometimes, I'll admit that I suppose. I was, my IVF, I was pregnant with twins. Unfortunately, I lost one of my twins um, in five months and I had to spend quite some time in hospital lying flat on my back. And it was at that stage that I actually wrote my business plan for my invention, because I had loads of time in my hands. When I came out of hospital with my husband thinking, right, she's carrying our child, I turned around and said to my husband, I wanted him to sell him the flat that he had when we got together, so that I had enough money to start my invention idea. He's still my husband today, by the way. <laughs> um, that's it there. And I'm hiding my bump. And by the way, see how much younger I am before you start inventing. If you want to keep your looks, don't invent. Um, Ujico, as Sandra called it, means electricity, water, gas, and eco. It was a rubbish name, and it still is today. But never mind, it stuck. Kids seem to like it. It was the way you see live energy. I wanted it to be easy and understood by some traffic lights. So that's basically a box with, with batteries in the back. It's not connected to anything. But as it was a very visual display, I wanted to have something that I could show the world and set in stone, this is my invention. That's what happened to the papers after about two months. Just went mad because no one in the world had ever done this before or even thought. Back in 2006, we didn't have the bills that we have nowadays. It didn't seem to be, it was a good idea, but it didn't seem to be as obvious as it now is. Um, my husband started checking me out on Google, and he's in bed when I go, Australian housewife to save the planet. Mm -hmm. I said, they must have read I was from Perth. <laughs> <laughs> so things started to get a complete life all of their own, and I just had to accept that, and it still is to this day. And obviously I'm being recorded today, and this is now being kept as well. So um, that's my son. Mm -hmm. Very healthy, bit problems with lungs, but he's absolutely fine now with my Jico, my two babies. Um, I then went on to win 14 awards with the invention, an idea. Um, very, very honoured um, to do so. I got absolutely legless with Deborah Meaden, by the way. <laughs> She's lovely, nothing like what you see on television. And behind her, with the white shirt, is Colin Firth. I even told him, because that's how drunk I was, that he didn't suit the glasses he was wearing. <laughs> I had no idea that I would ever be in that situation. So it's taken me places where I could only ever imagine it would take me. I won British Female Inventor of the Year in 2008. And I cried and cried and cried. And then they said, you need to go on BBC World Service. So I remember going upstairs. This is in the, the Cardiff um, Assembly, you know, the Welsh Assembly. Going up the stairs to go live on, on BBC World News. And it was about 11, half as 11 at night. And then I got a text from my mum. Oh, sorry to hear you've got a cold. And I'm like, no, I've not. I was just crying so much. <laughs> 
I was so happy. I just thought if my teachers could only see me now, and honestly, that is what went through my head on stage. And that's probably what made me cry more than ever, was I thought if I had only been recognised back then, then how life, different my life would be. Now, my father's dyslexic, but he's, he's different from me. He's ambidextrous, which growing up was quite... Uh, quite unusual to watch. He's no lead hand. He can do everything exactly the same. He'll just grab a pen and do the same on left and right. He's got the most amazing picture memory. I do, but he's got the most amazing memory. And he, he's, he works for a family business, so he always managed. He, he, it was easier for him. My little sister, who's a lot younger than me, my half-sister, they found out, because of myself and my dad, they found out when she was at primary school, she went on to be an architect. So if I had been captured earlier, my life might have been different. However, I've had a very happy life, so I don't regret it at all. Um, the um, top spot for the environment, really, which is what that one was. Yes. <laughs> I always feel now, whenever I'm doing anything at all, I'm being you know, assessed as to how green I am. However, I really am nowadays, because of Yujiko and what I now know, it has focused me a lot more. I even went out to South Africa when Rebecca was in power. He took me out and I spoke in front of 1,400 women for over two hours with the vice president on stage. Most amazing experience. And these women, people often say, who inspires me? Just everyday people, because everybody has got something special within them. Everybody has gone on a journey. Everybody's done something that has, you know, has made their mark. Um, so I love that experience. Very honoured. Um, there's a wonderful organisation called Anti-Copyright and Design. They asked me to be the first female ambassador. Sebastian Conran and Kevin McLeod were the two male ambassadors when I joined, and I was so chuffed. But I've got patents and I've got design registrations, and I'm someone who never thought that I was ever, ever going to get the patents. Um, you know, I, I, I'm ambassador to say that it doesn't matter if you're a woman or you're dyslexic or you don't have the formal education, you can go ahead and invent things. I actually wrote my patent whilst I was pregnant, lying in bed with a bad cold for nearly three weeks. And I just literally lay in bed, did lots of research, did lots of mind maps. And I had great patent lawyers who were then able to put it all into the documents that I then needed. But I didn't get very much help. I did do the vast majority all by myself. British Library voted Yujiko as one of the most iconic conventions of the 21st century. And that's a wonderful inventor called Sir, um, Trevor Bayliss. He is one that needs locked in a shed, though. He's lovely, but completely off his rocker. And it, it was Nelson Mandela that made his invention very famous because he had the wind-up radio. And Nelson Mandela said that he had changed communication within the third world. Um, and that's, he's gone on to help many, many inventors, including myself, who mentored me for quite a while. Um, yeah, my, my cure for constipation. Um, Radio 4 wanted to follow me for a whole year as a woman in business and I thoroughly enjoyed the experience because it was a good way of me sort of assessing where I was but I did find it extremely nerve-wracking. It was nearly 5 million people listened to me once a month and I was inundated with emails that I just didn't have an ability to respond to. I've never in my life had a PA or had somebody monitoring it all. I have had to muddle through it and everything I do. Um, back in 2011, Vince Cable asked me to join the Government Entrepreneur Forum. I actually thought it was a bit of a wind-up. <laughs> I just put it at the bottom of the pile of my desk, and then I got an email about five weeks later to say, you haven't replied to Vince's letter. I was like, oh, it's real. <laughs> um, I'm actually meeting him next week when I'm down in London, and I do quite a lot of work for Biz, and I love the fact that they are listening to what's going on in the UK, and they do want to know on the grass grassroots of business. Oh, I'm very honoured um, to represent Perth College, UHI, where I did all my training, my sort of different classes, to get my brain moving, um, to represent them to meet the Queen and tell her all about my Yujiko story. And she did genuinely seem to be quite interested. She's a lovely lady. I always remember her blusher. It's right up here. <laughs> you know, when she first came towards me, I had to have a curtsy. I always remember that, but she was lovely. But just very with it, very knowledgeable. And I don't think she had been told beforehand too much about everybody. She met too many people that day for her to, I think, take it all in beforehand. Now, Yujiko, where is it today? Well, it's in homes all over the UK. Um, it's specified. So architects and builders actually specify it as part of the, the, the property. And interestingly, when I went through all the patents, tried to raise all my money, Everybody kept saying, who's going to be your competitors? And I did struggle with that, and I looked and reviewed all the marketplace, because there is a few out there now, none like Yujiko, though, none using the existing meters to make them smart. 
um, the patents that we have haven't really been infringed. But interestingly, the government give the builders the same points for putting an energy monitor as they do for putting a bike shed in the garden. Because they say if you've got a bike shed, you're going to have a bike and you're not going to use your car. So you're going to use, reduce the same carbon emissions as you would if you had an energy monitor in your house. So after all those years, my direct competitor with Yujiko is a garden shed. <laughs> and I used to have Google alerts and I used to read until sort of half past two, three every morning and still get up with my son all the time keeping up with competitors, keeping up with the, the world market. <coughs> and in the end, there you go, garden sheds. Um, it's in businesses all over the UK, especially in schools, which I'm very passionate about, educating children on how the energy is being used. And it's live and it's real time. And you walk about and different classes can have it on a daily basis. And it really starts to change the behaviour within schools. And I'm very proud of how, how beneficial it is. I also did some TV. Um, it was on at 10 o'clock at night on BBC Two, and it was for kids. What's the point trying to educate us if they're going to have things on at that time? I was so disappointed, but it was an amazing programme, and it was lovely working with Kate. I thoroughly enjoyed it. That was my graduation back in July. Uh, most proudest moment of all. And again, I thought of my teachers when I was on stage, thinking if you could see me now. Now, at Yujiko, I raised four and a half million pounds over nine rounds. And I must admit, I really didn't celebrate through many of them because you just have to deliver on the business plan that has got you that money in the first place. So it's a big learning curve for me and a very difficult time. I wrote 14 business plans in my first two years, continuously updating it. So I have had to work a lot with IT, but there's so much out there nowadays to help you. Um, my proudest moment is that the government have now mandated all... Um, homes are going to have a live display with a smart meter by 2020. So they've accepted smart meters are not just the right thing. Um, and I'm keeping up the theme reducing energy because I'm now um, the owner and director of a secondary glazing company called Glaze and Save. My team are actually in Glasgow today fitting some systems to a lovely flat. I'm looking forward to hearing how they get on. I'm also spending a lot of time on good causes now with my work like with Vince Cable. I help Napier, sec Napier secure funding for a construction um, innovation centre. I'm also working with a, an invention called Gripaws, which I'll tell you about. Um, and the rest of my time is working on consulting. I actually worked on a vet vet veterinary product just now and I, I wrote a 33-page business plan and you should see the markups on this business plan. I'm still dyslexic, I still struggle, but my clients understand where I am at and utilise the strengths I have and fill in the gaps and the weaknesses. So I'm very lucky that I'm in that fortunate position. This is Grupo's. Um, Grupo's was invented by a lovely couple in Ailith. They were on a, a flight to Cyprus and she got a deep vein thrombosis and she had to get her leg amputated. She's also had two heart attacks, Diana um, Stewart her name is, and she struggles be able to get a wheelchair wheels going round. So her husband um, invented this grip to go round the wheelchair. And we've just launched it on Kickstarter on Friday. We need to raise 22,500 by selling the product and also rewards to be able to get this to market as a social enterprise. So please, if you could pick up any cards and have a look at the website. And I've got some samples here for you to feel. Fantastic ability to be able to get people in wheelchairs, but a lot more mobile. There's a really good film within the Kickstarter of showing her struggling and then showing the difference with having the grips on her wheelchair. So please, if you get a chance. And I love being able to help inventors these days. I love to help others because I really understand now what you need to do to take it to market. Now, the advice that I could give to dyslexics, don't be afraid to say that you are. I wrote this and then I thought, hmm. However, there are times when you just don't say your weaknesses. And I've learned that through my boards and through the different people that I've had around me within UGCO. And it was a very testing time for me. And some people did, unfortunately, grasp and say, no, you're not capable. We're going to take that off you and we're going to give it to someone else. So <laughs> things are changing, but you have to maybe understand first rather than go straight in with both feet and say, I'm dyslexic. It's monitor things and, and find out first before you say anything. So don't be afraid to explore, I should say, and then say that you're dyslexic. Um, love that you're different. Find out who you can benefit from unique skills. I wouldn't change the way I am. I actually quite like the way that I see life and the way I do things. My husband thinks I'm absolutely hilarious. 
Um, and a boss, I remember one of my jobs, I filled up the van with diesel and I had the receipt and I couldn't remember how to spell diesel, so I just put petrol receipt. He was hunting me for about four hours, just before mobile phones, because he thought I'd put petrol in the van. <laughs> so some people don't find my dyslexia fun. Um, get out of your comfort zone once in a while. Look what I've done, getting out of my comfort zone. If I'd never had Lyme disease, there's no way that I would have thought that I would have been capable of all this. Um, make your life as easy as possible. Um, I'm, I'm quite well in doubt, so I've got the ability to hide a tape recorder down my chest <laughs> and record so many of my meetings. I actually don't tell people I'm doing this because I'm only listening to myself anyway. One, it's good sometimes to hear what you say, that you're using you know, one mouth and two ears. But secondly, especially in my industry, or all the industries I work in, there's a lot of acronyms, and I just simply can't keep up with conversations. Tape recording it gives you the ability then to go back again and again. So I advise that. And also, just the phones, your laptop. I, I find life so much easier these days than ever before. So, you know, please just don't be afraid to use the tools around you and think how you can make your life easier. Um, and if you find a job that you enjoy, then you'll never work another day in your life. And I think that's where I am in my life. I so, so enjoy my work. I have to work very hard and long hours, but it just doesn't feel like work at all. I so thoroughly enjoy it. Um, that's my son, my stepdaughter, and my little puppy, Charlie. And unfortunately, none of them are dyslexic, which I feel is a bit of a shame, but never mind. And thank you all for listening.